Hey everybody, we're back. It's the Headbangers Book Club, and boy, have we had a uh, an interesting couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, my name is Zach. I'm Kelly. And uh, <laughs> we uh, so let me let me once again start this episode by explaining uh, what has been happening in in the interim. It's not this is not an excuse because I don't think anybody at this point I don't think anybody actually expects us to to record every two weeks. This is more like I just want to. I just want to make it clear uh, what what we have gone through to be bringing this this podcast episode <laughs> to you today. So, uh, first of all, the 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 week weekend before we were supposed to record, I uh, tested positive for COVID uh, after two years of uh, assiduously avoiding any contact with the virus. I let my guard down like an idiot. Uh, me and my fiance went to see Paul McCartney at Oriole Stadium or whatever it's called, Oriole Field, uh, Camden Yards, I guess, in in Baltimore. And we were like, oh, it's, you know, we're outdoors, blah, blah, blah. We can leave our masks off. And A, no, you can't. <laughs> and, and that's, there is no B, actually. There, there's, there, it, but I, I guess it's like it, A, uh, we were jammed in too fucking close for that to be the case, even in pre Omicron days. And B, we're not in pre Omicron days. So, uh, and everybody was yelling. It was probably the most the most singing I've ever uh, witnessed from a from an audience. So, like, just you know, everybody has their masks off except for maybe a couple people around us. Um, everybody's just yelling at the top of their lungs and singing along and doing the na na nas and hey Jude. It's like we were fucked. We were just to- totally fucked. So um, got COVID. Uh, that same weekend, Callie's car was ro- was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to see Steely Dan. Um, and I did wear a mask, so I did not get COVID. Yeah, so, that's, so that's there you the, go. That's like, the good news. Yeah. But literally, the the day after that, my car was stolen um, at gunpoint, and I no longer have a car. So, <laughs> so I was like, I have, I have understandably not felt like fucking talking about Morris Day for the last two weeks because I've been really, really upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, shockingly the the first thing that came to mind was not talking about Morris Day's book i was a i was worried that i wouldn't be in any condition to talk about his book but luckily it was a mild case of covid and i i was pretty much over it within a week um i had a little bit of a lingering cough but uh but like now i'm just you know totally back to normal just the the regular amount of cough that i have every every uh pollen season but then there you know there's this whole thing and just like i i just feel like it it would have been not a great idea to try and record this podcast when <laughs> like we're upset and traumatized. Yeah, no, yeah. I literally just started being able to like function like a normal person. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's what's been going on in our lives, I guess. Uh, the the one thing I, I I will use my tiny platform here and say uh, the pandemic's not over. I didn't think it was over. It's not like I've just been, you know, out there like uh, I, I, I've I, I wear a mask everywhere except for the fucking Paul McCartney concert. And sure enough, the the one time I take off my mask, that's that's what happens. So don't uh, be an idiot like me. Keep your mask on even when you're outdoors, if you're in a crowd. And uh, yeah, let's hope that that is my first and last <laughs> case of, of COVID. Uh, so. Anyway, we are back and we're finishing up our discussion of Morris Days on time. I do have a couple of comments from uh, the last time. Let's see. Let's let's actually start with somebody uh, who we haven't heard from yet, although I am recognizing the name Copper Smith. Uh, this was a YouTube comment. I, I want to say that Copper Smith might have posted... A comment on my Prince blog. I think that might be where he's coming from. I apologize if I've got that wrong. The name's familiar, but he's not one of our usual crowd. And he reported back on the audiobook because we were talking about um, that we were salty that Morris didn't record his own audiobook. He said, It's all right. 
Ron Butler's Prince sounds more like Jesse Johnson, while his <laughs> Morris sounds more like a high school algebra teacher trying to sound cool. And it irked me that he pronounced the time song seven 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 nine three one one. So <laughs> it sounds like we didn't miss anything by opting to to not read uh, or or not what do you call it? Listen to the audiobook. And then uh, most of the rest of the conversation was about don't let your don't let. OK, so first of all, I have a <laughs> this actually is reminding me I have a uh, I, I have a correction, uh, an important correction to post. Uh, we, we we spent like, I don't know, five to ten minutes talking about <laughs> don't. We, we said, don't let you meatloaf, which is which it was fascinating and puzzling me um, up until the moment that I realized like a fucking moron. I misread the comment and it was don't let your meatloaf, which, while <laughs> still stupid, is uh, it's not nonsensical. Don't let I understand what don't let your meatloaf means. Um I, I kind of, I, I have to say, I, I kind of prefer the absurdity of "Don't let you meatloaf," <laughs> <laughs> and I and, and I and I like turning that around to be "Don't let me meatloaf," uh, just because I, I just like the idea of meatloaf as a verb. Um, but but I, it, it was my mistake, not Jay May's. Uh, what Tommy Lee actually wrote on the drumhead was "Don't let your meatloaf," and then I bring this up because jukebox cowboy. Uh, you know, longtime listener, he came in and said, don't let your meatloaf is a line from the blue light by Zappa. But I reckon don't let you meatloaf is much, much better. So he agrees. I miss the Zappa reference. Also, I'm like a, I, I'm like sort of a Zappa fan, but not, you know, a lot of the seventies and eighties and nineties <laughs> Zappa. I have not, uh, basically everything, almost everything from the post flow and Eddie era. I, <laughs> uh, is yet to be, uh, fully explored by me. So, um, so that went right over my head. Um, anyway, Jay may responded. I, I hesitate to read this out loud because it, it, um, just sounds like I'm, you know, <laughs> getting off on how funny we are. But he said, I can't breathe laughing till I'm crying. Thank you. Everything sounds like Tommy Lee. Uh, merch it up. Give my sticker to Jukebox, please. And thank you. Oh, I have no idea what Tommy Lee was trying to do. Everything he was doing was very fast. <laughs> 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 and then he said, I hope Ghost Prince plays Coachella soon. I yeah, me too. That would actually get me that would get me out to Coachella. I would wear a mask, but I would but I would go if Ghost Prince came. Um so yeah, I think it's I think it's only right that Jukebox Cowboy gets a sticker because we've given stickers to like every one of our other uh regular commenters. And at this point we have to have other people listen to the podcast because we'll we'll have we'll have uh offered them to everybody everybody who listens. So, <laughs> so let's try and, uh, let's try and get some fresh blood out there. Uh, so that's don't let you meatloaf. Don't let your meatloaf. Don't let us meatloaf or our meatloaf. <laughs> uh, finally, Marty white. This is, this is critical. So we've talked about the Eagles. Um, and we were like, is there an Eagles book? And Marty white said, I thought I'd let you know about Don Felder's book, heaven and hell about his life and time in the Eagles. It could be a wild ride at times. As a matter of fact, keeping in line with your criteria, there's a cocaine reference in the first paragraph. And, um, he goes on to say Felder's narrative voice could be a bit dull at times, but I think in order to be in the Eagles, you either had to be a dullard or an asshole. The one exception to that might be Joe Walsh. I don't know whether or not he's an asshole, but he's no dullard. Uh, I don't think Joe Walsh is an asshole. Um, and I do agree. Like I, I, I talk a lot of shit about the Eagles, even though I secretly actually like a lot of their music. Um, I, I know it's like not cool at all on any level to like the Eagles, but uh, they got some jams. There's a reason why, you know, their greatest hits is one of the best selling albums ever. Uh, but all of the fucking Eagles, except for Joe Walsh, were just uh, insufferable bastards. And I am super interested in reading Don Felder's book because I love latter day drama in bands, you know, like you expect the drama when they're in their twenties and thirties, but I like it when they break up and get back together and there's more drama. And I, and I know that that's exactly what we're going to get from Don Felder because, because I know that he, 
famously, he was there at the breakup. I, I think it was him that Glenn Fry was threatening to kick his ass during the, the last concert that they played together. And then he got back together with them in the 90s and they did the whole Hell Freezes Over tour. And, um, and then he got kicked out of the fucking band again. So like... I am super interested like, in he's reading about like that. The Peter Chris of the, <laughs> yeah, of the Beatles a little, exactly. Or, oh God, the Eagles a little bit. Exactly. And and who had the best book out of the four Kiss <laughs> members? It was Peter Chris. So yeah, like that's down. the guy you want. You don't want to read from. There's honestly a lot of parallels between the Eagles and Kiss because you have the <laughs> you have the um, the duo who are like. Uh, the stick in the mud bosses, you know, like Glenn Fry and Don Henley are the Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley of the Eagles. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Don Felder is like both, both Ace and Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, I guess Joe Walsh, Joe Walsh by that standard is uh, Tommy Thayer because he, he came in late and yeah. uh, he's the only one that all of them like. Uh, so <laughs> do you, re- do you remember, uh, forever ago, it had to have been like 15 years ago when I found Joe Walsh's website oh. and, he, and he had that video on there that like, I wish that back then I had known how to like take screen, like like record my my screen yeah because i cannot find this video anywhere and no one will believe me that it exists <laughs> it was this video of joe walsh and like this was like the video that automatically played when you went to his website and so you open up the <laughs> website and there's just this little video embedded into it that when you first go to the, the page it's just an empty like computer room like basic like <laughs> your grandpa's like <laughs> computer room whatever <laughs> Or your dad's, like, empty computer room or office. And then you hear a, a chair rolling in. And then a computer <laughs> chair rolls in. And Joe says, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to get this uh, video to work. Uh, how you doing? Like, something like that. <laughs> it was literally that amateur. And then... It was like on there for probably a couple of days and I went inside and then I feel like probably it was like publicist or something. It was like, you have to take this down. But, oh man, it was my favorite thing ever. I can't find it on YouTube. I can't find it anywhere. Because I guess no one was checking for like Joe Walsh archives. I guess not. <laughs> That's a, it's like the Library of Alexandria. This is a great a great historical document has been has been lost. I know, uh, I know, and I've told other people about it, and it like sounds like it did not happen. But I it swear sounds like a fever to dream. God, you remember it, right? I do. I in fact, I am I am not even joking when I say that I literally was talking about it today to to to, to Kia uh, because. <laughs> We were talking about, um, oh, it's Ringo. We're recording this on Ringo Starr's birthday. And for, for those who don't know, Ringo Starr is, in, in fact, Joe Walsh's uh, brother-in-law. Oh, what? <laughs> uh, what? Or, or, I didn't know or, Wait that. a second. Well, uh, yeah, I think that is what it is because cause jo- <laughs> Ringo is married to Barbara Bach. And Joe is married to Barbara Bach's sister, I think. Oh. That, that's brother-in-law, right? Or like brother-in-law I so. by I marriage. Don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't understand extended family. I, I don't either. But anyway, they're they're extended relatives. I don't know what the exact uh, term is, but but yeah. So they're they're related. And um, I wish they would do a video together. I wish so too because their <laughs> online personas are very similar. Like Ringo's whole thing is he wants you to. Like wherever you are in the world on his birthday at noon, he wants you to stop what you're doing and say peace and love and <laughs> give the, and give the peace signs. And of course, if you've ever followed Ringo on Twitter, um, it it is just uh, just chef's kiss. Like the uh, he he'll post something with a ton of typos and like a bunch of completely gibberish emojis, and then if he finds the typo he doesn't delete his tweet he'll just like post a follow-up tweet that says oops and and correct and and corrects it like (laughs) it is just the the most perfect version of a grandpa let loose on social media (laughs) and a a, a, you know like booze addled grandpa let loose on social media um i love it so much and and then like yeah joe walsh is very much cut from a similar cloth his i feel like his social media presence is more polished than ringo's but 
well, his not, version well, of that. Now, but yeah, like, his what, version of that on the website. Ago, it fucking wasn't because right on his website, he had that <laughs> video, it autoplayed as soon as you went to his website. <laughs> it was the first thing you saw. You go to joewalsh.com or whatever the fuck, and the first thing you hear is roll, like the, a computer chair rolling over wood floor. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm new to this. This website stuff, trying to figure it out as soon as I uh, get this camera working. <laughs> it was like that stuff. And then you went over and looked at his merch, and all of his merch said, Hey, how you doing? Like, why is Joe Walsh's catchphrase, How you doing? It's just a completely uh, regular thing that, uh, that the dads all over the world say. I know. I know. <laughs> Joe Walsh is kind of like the ultimate dad. He's like America's dad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I reject that it was Bill Cosby. My dad no, is, is my Joe dad Walsh, is Joe Walsh. <laughs> um, and, and also my president. So um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I don't remember how we got on that subject, but yeah, I was literally I was saying, uh, oh, it's the Ringo's Peace and Love Day. Um, it reminds me of uh, this video <laughs> with Joe Walsh. So yeah, that's what just one of those things that's been living in my head for the last. Uh, and God, and like, it's like no one will believe. I don't think anyone except us saw it. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a mass hallucination, I never want to. Yeah. Uh, I never want it to be disproven. Like I, I, I it's <laughs> it's sacred to me. Um, so, all of which is to say, uh, yeah, Joe Walsh, objectively the best eagle. Uh, so good that I, I don't even really consider him an eagle. Um, he, he, he just seems like uh, he, he seems like the guy who they brought in to make them seem cool uh, and successfully because yeah. i don't think i like the eagles before joe walsh <laughs> and i like pre-eagles joe walsh too i think aside from him being a hilarious drunk he's also an excellent songwriter and guitarist yeah so yeah, yeah absolutely totally team joe walsh <laughs> maybe he'll but write you know a book what? i also like i also like don henley's solo stuff better than the eagles too so yeah i, don't know. I guess i just don't fucking like the eagles <laughs> Glenn Fry's solo stuff is great too. Yeah, sexy girl. Uh, the yeah. heat is on. <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> uh, anyway, let's talk about let's talk about Morris Day. When we uh, when we last left Morris Day, he was um, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. He he uh, on the one hand had to be rescued from from holding up in a was it a hotel room freebasing. Uh, on the other hand, he had, you know, just made his motion picture debut. He had a reasonably successful solo album out and, um, he was free of Prince's (laughs) tyrannical grasp. Uh, so the book where we, where we pick up today, we're picking up on chapter 15, the character, um, which opens with an extended quote from the lyrics of the song, um, And I guess what I'll say about this is we kind of touched on this last time that sort of the overarching theme of this book is the gap. Morris trying to navigate the gap between Morris Day, the real person and, you know, quote unquote Morris Day or MD is the is the persona that he actually writes into the book, Uh, you know, all bold type yelling about how great drugs are. Uh, (laughs) And, uh, and that sort of, you know, that's the persona that Prince kind of created for him. And that is still to this day, when you go to his website and get a, um, get a cameo, (laughs) a knockoff cameo done. It's, it's, you know, this is the Morris day character. And, uh, and so, so much of this book is about him kind of navigating the gap between that. And, you know, we see in the second half of the book, uh, the problems that it creates. Cause you know, he, he starts out, he has a drug problem. Um, he has a much longer lasting problem with womanizing. Um, and it's really only toward the end of the book that he is finally kind of able to to figure that out and, and, you know, keep the, and, and the book spoiler alert ends with the stage Morris day and the, and the real Morris day being kind of safely separated and distinct. And, um, you know, he ends it in, on a, on a, on a high note, but, um, that's kind of the theme, the theme of the book and this song, the character is very much about that. It's a, it's about like, um, you know, being a, 
a, a different person than the kind of role that you're playing in public. Uh, yeah. So while he's getting ready for the tour, for his first solo tour behind the color of success, he meets the woman who would become his second wife or first, 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 wife. first wife, second baby's mama, I think. Um, yes. And that's uh, Judith Jones. Uh, she's a background singer and uh so they they get together and that becomes important later because a lot of the the drama in the second book is predicated by the sort of decline of, of, of their marriage i thought it was interesting that he felt some kind of way about uh prince making under the cherry moon with jerome benton um yeah because jerome benton was his sidekick right right which i never really thought of it that way like i i did I'm a, uh, as, as you may know, uh, if you've, if you've listened to our pod, we actually did a podcast about under the cherry moon a long, long time ago. Um, we did, graf- did we do graffiti bridge? I don't think we ever did graffiti bridge. We kind of, we, we, we should. We should. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> it wouldn't be for Headbangers time. book club, but it, it would be for, you know, like a, like a, we'll, we'll resurrect the old dystopian dance party feed and, uh. And talk about that that classic of uh, of modern day cinema, Graffiti Bridge. But we did definitely do one about Under the Cherry Moon. I I love Under the Cherry Moon. It's an objectively bad movie. Um, I you know when I view it through the eyes of someone who doesn't have a super high tolerance for just Prince goofing around like it's basically the most expensive home movie ever made. Uh, it's like when you make like when I was a kid, me and my friends would use my friend's parents' video camera and and make and make movies uh, of us of, of stuff that was like only funny to us. Uh, it's like that, but Prince hired Michael Bauhaus to do, uh, you know, like a gorgeous black and white cinematography in the south of France. Uh, it is one of the most just awe-inspiringly self-indulgent projects ever committed to film. Uh, and it has a, a completely kick-ass soundtrack that's one of Prince's best albums. Um, yeah, it, it's just, I, I love it so much, but I would never recommend it to, <laughs> to anyone. Although I think I have made uh, every one of my romantic partners in my life watch Under the Cherry Moon at some point, And the operative word being made. Uh, so, <laughs> um, that's me with Graffiti Bridge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Graffiti Bridge is uh, honestly, I would say it's more self indulgent, but I don't think it was as expensive as Under the Cherry Moon. So there's like something about like, so that, like that that element of it, uh, and, and it's and also it's consequently less watchable than Under the Cherry Moon, which is either a good thing or a bad thing depending <laughs> on who you are. If you're Kelly, it's a good thing because I feel like the worse the better with you. <laughs> <laughs> the soundtrack is worse the cinematography is worse uh the, even the script is worse to be honest like <laughs> it, it looks like it well it's in the 90s and it has that like soundstage look so it looks similar to how like the super mario brothers movie looked it's like that same kind of like it's always dark it's always night night yeah and just like kind of ugly yeah <laughs> but also surreal like yeah there's actually there's things i like about graffiti bridge too it's it's less watchable than under the cherry moon and the music's not as good it but, just depends um, on what you're what you want from it the costume design is incredible and um and the part where ingrid chavez dies is one of the it's... funniest scenes ever I've ever seen in film. <laughs> Why did that man get in that seat? There was no reason. It's, it's the eternal question. Uh, but so anyway, under, but under the cherry moon, like the thing about it is, it's starring Prince, but not as Prince. Um, technically, or the kid. Or the kid, yeah, because technically Purple Rain wasn't really Prince, but now he's a totally different character. He's a gigolo living in the south of France, and um, for some reason, uh, Jerome, because I guess he just inherited Jerome in the in the custody agreement when Morris Day left <laughs> and the time <laughs> broke up. Uh, now Jerome is his sidekick slash possibly lover. Uh, it's it's unclear, <laughs> but but they're awfully comfortable 
being in the same room while Prince is taking a bath. That's all I'm saying. And and Jerome has now become become um, uh, Prince's sidekick. And Morris kind of interprets that as, well, he says, um, when you made your, because a lot of this book is written in the second person with Morris talking directly to Prince's ghost. Uh, he said, when you made your second movie, you were quick to pluck Jerome Benton out of my entourage and put him in yours. That meant, of course, that Jerome wouldn't be touring with me. Jerome was no longer my sidekick. He was your sidekick. You were letting me know that you didn't need me. And he he went on to say that he heard rumors that the original follow-up to Purple Rain, planned by Prince, was supposed to be the <laughs> the adventures of Morris and Jerome. I don't know if I believe <laughs> I, that. I, um, so uh, this actually, I was going to bring this up when we got to Graffiti Bridge, but it's it's actually relevant I've heard the same thing about Graffiti Bridge from, I think Morris has said it, and I think also Jimmy Jam and Terry, Terry Lewis have said, said it, that originally the pitch for Graffiti Bridge was going to be a movie about the time. And I, I mean, which it kind of is. It kind of is. is. It kind of is a movie a where the time are the, the time. villains. Yeah, <laughs> you see way more of the time than you did in Purple Rain. That is true, and you they all kind the, of have them living together, and um, <laughs> the whole opening scene is them uh, talking about needing more money. And yeah, they're doing s- crimes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> doing everything inside. <laughs> <laughs> they go into they go into different uh, clubs and vandalize them, and then when they run out, they yell, "Took it everything in sight." <laughs> As if you're not like that's their tagline. Right, Morris. Um, uh, Morris pisses in Prince's potted plant uh, in a in a very lengthy <laughs> see, scene, um, and then sets it on fire because his, his urine is flammable. Because his pee is flammable. That's a <laughs> it's a little known fact about Morris Day. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have my doubts basically that the time were ever big enough to to green light for Warner Brothers to green light but I feel like Warner Brothers barely wanted Prince to make Graffiti Bridge it was only because he'd done Purple Rain and he agreed to make it a sequel that they coughed up the um, honestly minor amount of money that that, <laughs> that movie cost to make um, I just don't see that i don't see and i i get that morris day was sort of like the breakout star of purple rain but i don't think that warner was ready to put him in a follow-up movie i just don't buy it um anyway so that's i i don't know i'm a i'm a time movie truther i guess i i just don't necessarily believe it i think maybe prince told them at some point that he'd love to do a movie for them but prince wanted to do a lot of shit and then he would lose interest in it after like five minutes so um, I don't know about that, but Morris has this interesting interpretation where he said that Prince played the Morris or the MD character from Purple Rain. Uh, in other words, he was playing his alter ego. To put the cherry on the cake, he recruited Jerome to be his foil. Um, and then he goes on to say, to be honest, I couldn't get through the whole movie, <laughs> which is, you know, fair. It's an acquired taste. Um, I guess I didn't really think about Christopher Tracy, his character from Under the Cherry Moon, being... Morris Day. Uh, He definitely does the Morris Day voice, but as we established in the first episode, that's also the Prince voice. So I I just kind of, I just kind of thought he was playing like a, uh, a blacker version of Prince. You know, he was sort of like, like code switching a little bit with that movie. And instead of playing the like mysterious kid role, now he's playing a more kind of streetwise character and he's able to engage in the kind of, uh, you know, joking around that the time do you, you know it's been to miami baby <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um <laughs> so uh i don't know but but morris wasn't happy about it well it's also kind of rich for morris to even have an opinion about a character that he was given an act like like it technically <laughs> is prince's character by right. morris's own admission so like why the fuck does, does he care <laughs> right yeah, uh, exactly. And I, this was a kind of a time where they were both sort of taking snipes at each other because he also talks about how uh, Prince on stage in the parade tour would um, <laughs> he would talk about he would call out the oak tree and then he would pretend to get an axe and chop the tree down. <laughs> uh, just because Prince is just one of the pettiest men to ever live. So uh, that's <laughs> just a fact. So let's see. Yeah, he does uh, Color of Success. He does his second album 
daydreaming. Uh, he does daydreaming while his wife Judy is pregnant with their first child. Mm. Is there anything else I want to say about that? Um, um, Fishna is one of the greatest songs ever written. Yeah, I mean, that's... Oh, another thing. Here, here's another video that we think <laughs> about all the time. <laughs> How did we find the infamous... I think... <laughs> I think I was just looking up Boris Day fishnet, and that for some reason that was a higher search <laughs> result than the actual video at the time. Because this was another one that was like 15 years ago that I found it, and it's still on the original video is still on YouTube. Yeah, this one we actually can corroborate. It it does exist. It wasn't just a, a, a hallucination. It's a, it's like a karaoke video. I think it had to have been contemporary to when. Fishnet was out. It, it was definitely like a, looks it was, like it. It was like a karaoke video from like Fish. Uh, fish. Oh my god. <laughs> Six, Six Flags. <laughs> Fishnet Flags. And, and my favorite thing about it is um, he doesn't say fishnets. He says fish legs <laughs> showing through the holes. Because <laughs> it's big legs, right? It's fishnet. And then it's big legs showing yeah, the walls. Yeah, yeah, fish, fish legs. Fish legs. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's amazing, and I'm obviously linking it in the in, in the show notes. Uh, why? What else is the point? Like, why even have show notes? <laughs> well, I've just I've watched that video so many times that when I I'm like playing fishnet in my head, I think <laughs> fish legs. <laughs> More often than I think the actual right. lyrics. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's almost it's almost superseded the the original uh, for me. <laughs> so that's the most important thing, in my opinion, about daydreaming. He also does talk about Morris is a big fan of his ballads, um, which I, I am that less makes of a one fan. Of us. Yeah. That, exactly. Because <laughs> he also talks about a man's pride uh, from daydreaming. And um, I'm not going to I'm not going to clown him him too much because it's not like he's Paul Stanley or anything. But um, <laughs> it is just I, it, the the extended quotes from Morris Day lyrics are just kind of funny to me. <laughs> That's, like as if it's poetry. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it's something that it's something that, that he felt. And, you know, it's his his uh, this kind of budding marriage, which is still going well. His son is born in the same year as the album comes out. Uh, and Daydreaming also comes out the same <laughs> the same year as Sign of the Times. And uh, he openly admits that uh, Prince won that that particular <laughs> matchup. He also has a um, mixed reaction to the Love Sexy album cover. <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand what the fuck he was talking about with that. Yeah. For, I think partly, I mean... Like, he starts talking about this because he says, meanwhile, more than ever, Prince's calling card was sex. And I just kind of, I disagree with that during the Love Sexy era. Yeah. I feel like you could say that around, like, Dirty Mind. Right. Um, I don't get that from Love Sexy. Well, Love Sexy was kind of one, I mean, there's still some, there's some racy lyrics in Love Sexy for sure. Um, like, especially the, the, the title track has some racy stuff in it. And um and glam slam he he says you like know, race cars burn rubber in your pants yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and on glam slam he says come a butterfly on your skin and you know I mean but for my print standards it's pretty that just pretty tame flowery like yeah like that's the thing like if you look at his earlier career like Dirty Mind in um, 1999 has some sexy stuff right yeah um, love sexy is I don't a really gospel view, album <laughs> yeah like it's I don't know maybe it's because I've heard the black album right so like compared to that but i don't i never i never really view um prince's music or his whole thing as being like about sex anyway like i mean it it is but right. it's not i wouldn't think of him as being like hyper sexy and using sex to sell records i i don't get that from prince yeah and especially because love sexy did not sell well i think a lot of people were turned off by the cover and you know there wasn't really an obvious single i guess alphabet street but you know um I, it, it just wasn't it wasn't a big hit so if he was using sex to sell it he did it did, it did not succeed <laughs> well and morris is making the point that like on the on the cover 
Prince was naked and sitting on a bed of oversized white and purple lilies. Right. And that's, like, supposed to be, like, a big, like, sexy album cover. But I don't view it like that, especially because it's, like, subverts male sexuality, especially, like, in the 80s. Right. I, I just don't... I, I never viewed, like, Prince's... I, f- I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, Prince writes songs about sex, and that's, like, his whole thing. But I don't view... <laughs> I've never viewed it like that. I think because, like, I don't see nudity as inherently sexual to begin with and also like he was purposefully like feminizing himself on that cover like it's a very feminine cover right um i just don't think of it as being like this this is a sexy album to sell <laughs> to, to up album sales like, yeah it, it was obviously supposed to be a spiritual album and i don't want to sit here and act like prince never wrote about sex and it was all spirituality but it's like deeper than just being like about sex because like acdc writes songs about sex <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah like if, <laughs> imagine if prince's songs were were like um giving the dog a bone <laughs> yeah i know i, know, <laughs> I mean exactly. he did hide the bone but you know <laughs> <laughs> but like imagine if that was all he did <laughs> love sexy is interesting because it makes people uncomfortable it's sort of like the one of my favorite Prince images is the um, the poster of him in the shower from Controversy, which yeah, I, I have. I have that in my bathroom. Yeah, um, I would have it in my bathroom, but Kia does not allow me to display it anywhere other than the, the laundry room because she basically never goes in there. <laughs> <laughs> like and, and Love Sexy is in that same category of it's like very it's it, it, it provokes like a visceral re- Positive or negative reaction in people. I, I don't think anybody looks at the shower poster or the Love Sexy album cover and is just like, I'm indifferent to this. Like, I, I think <laughs> I think people react in some way. And I used to, um, when I was in grad school, I whenever I used a public computer, I used to save the wallpaper as the Love Sexy album cover, and I would call it print, Prince Bombing. Uh, <laughs> and, and just, uh, you know, like, just leave people with, with the next person to log into the computer. They get assaulted with uh, this very disarming, nude but not sexualized photo of, of, of Prince. Um, but yeah, I think what's controversial about the cover is I mean it is the nudity, but I think what makes people uncomfortable is is more the fact that he's sort of reversing the gaze. You know, like that's right. that's not the way men, uh, at least you know, certainly straight men have traditionally been represented in in art. So yeah, which, which I think is counter to what Morris Day is saying. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, Morris did Morris didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he does to his credit. He does. Uh, Prince argues with him a little bit and kind of, and kind of sticks up for himself. Um, but uh, but yeah, Morris doesn't get love sexy. Um, <laughs> so uh, then we go on to uh, a lot of the latter half of the book is Prince and Morris kind of drifting in and out of each other's circles. Obviously for the first couple of years after Morris's solo album, they are not on great terms with, with each other. Uh, you know, Prince is chopping down the Oak tree and stealing his, his sidekick slash manservant. But Morris kind of gets back together with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who are also on the outs with Prince um, around the same period. And they they produced Fishnet, which is one of the reasons why it is such a slapper. And um, (laughs) and I think that kind of caught is this like quasi time reunion kind of caught Prince's eye. Um, So Prince and Morris reconnect for the first time and they decide to start working on a new album together um, sort of in the old time style. So it's like Prince writes the songs, Morris plays the drums and sings, and nobody else is, <laughs> is involved. And um, the album was going to be called Corporate World. And this is uh, where some of the stuff from that came, later came out on Graffiti Bridge, Prince's soundtrack, and the Times actual comeback album, Pandemonium, um, some of that stuff came out on Corporate World or was going to be on Corporate World, uh, most importantly being Donald Trump black version, <laughs> which is um, <laughs> uh, the song that keeps on giving. It's it's like um, it was already a very stupid song when it was recorded in 1989. And then, of course, uh, we all know what happened with Donald Trump. And uh, now it is um, just a black mark on uh 
on Morris and Prince's uh, mutual discographies. <laughs> <laughs> um, I there was a period of time, and this was before Trump was elected, I think. But there was a period of time where my Spotify would not <laughs> fucking stop going to Donald. It was like every single time I put my Spotify on shuffle, it put Donald Trump like version on to the point where I had to just like un like it so it would take it out of my like songs because usually i'll just put that on shuffle and it was like i had to just unheart it or whatever because i it kept going to donald trump like like no matter what the shuffle was somehow it would find a way to put donald trump like version into the shuffle <laughs> and i don't even listen to that song that often so it was totally just my spotify decided to like that song <laughs> yeah that's uh th- that's hilarious because uh, it, it is just like it's such a stupid song it's so stupid it's like, that i that i love it like it's the way it starts too it's like wah, 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 wah. it's just like a funny like sound at the beginning of it <laughs> um so um corporate world doesn't doesn't happen because basically prince kind of i mean it's it's sort of unclear what happened i think and I don't this think is just what he was doing during this period of time is doing uh, albums with people and then shelving them. And then shelving them. With Rosie Gaines albums. Right. Too. Yeah, I- exactly. Um, and I think from from Morris's perspective, at least, Prince just kind of like lost interest and decided to roll it into Graffiti Bridge, which I think is very possible. I think also part of me and I think I've heard this um, somewhere else is that. Warner really wanted Warner was like, if you're going to get the time together, uh, you've got to get Jam and Lewis back because they were, you know, uh, they were honestly their career was going better than Prince's at that at that point because they produced, you know, Janet Jackson. Um, they'd all they'd done control uh, and they, they were working on on Rhythm Nation and they and, and Prince was kind of hitting a commercial slump during this period. So I think there was some pressure from the label to like, if you're going to do the time, you got to do the original time. And actually, now you have to give them some creative control. So long story short the the time get rolled into graffiti bridge the movie and they do their own kind of spin-off album from that which is sort of this weird grab bag of stuff from corporate world um stuff from even before because um their chocolate comes from the sessions for ice cream castle and um my summertime thing comes from also those those same sessions so they brought back some stuff from like 83 and, and my then, summertime thing became the latest fashion right yeah now. so they so they put it out twice in the same year <laughs> and and i'm not oh, going to lie I I yeah because that. it's my summertime thing is on um pandemonium oh. and the latest fashion is on graffiti bridge <laughs> okay and um yeah, I, I might get in trouble for this, but I think they both kind of suck. So yeah, I don't like either. Of them either. Um, I don't like any of the songs really that appear in of the time songs that appear in Graffiti Bridge, but I do like Pandemonium the album. Pandemonium the album fucking rules. <laughs> I, and like Jerk Out is referenced in Graffiti Bridge, but does not appear on the soundtrack. Right. But Jerk Out, Chocolate, the title track are all great. I like Blondie that like appears in a very small part in the background of the Oh club. yeah. Right. Yeah. But I I like a lot of songs on Pandemonium. I like very few songs on the Graffiti Bird soundtrack. And the ones that I do like are all songs that were recorded like earlier and not released right yeah graffiti bridge is rough uh the, <laughs> but like the prince songs he was kind of he kind of just like cleared out the vault and um the best songs on that album were from years earlier like the question of you um i like elephants joy, and flowers joy and repetition funny. yeah elephants and flowers i i agree i think that's i think that's the one for me oh and thieves in the temple is okay but yeah, I, thieves in the temple is the well that's like the song that, right that came out with that movie and tick tick bang is good but not the version on graffiti bridge the original version that was like a new wave like rockabilly type thing yeah from the very early 80s is great but the one it ruins it on for the me. graffiti bridge soundtrack <laughs> fucking sucks that which is said, especially I, a I bummer still... because that scene is one of the best scenes well in, in i was the gonna movie. say like i completely stand by the fact that, that the kid should have won that fight this dude he wrote 
beat me on his chest with a heart around it. <laughs> it's like he's, all he's, smudged, he's, too. He's wearing a little singlet. Yeah, it's like written with like eyeliner or something. He's in a little singlet. They signal the beginning of the battle by by um, setting out fireworks, and so the time run out, and then he just like is singing this song about coming and humping the ground and stuff, and then they're all just sitting around like shaking their head, and then I think like, is it Jimmy Jam, who's on a, who's playing a Game Boy or something? <laughs> one, one of them, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, how are y'all that just letting this man win this fight? I know. Who had the, um, who, which, was it Jimmy Jam also who had the sampling keyboard? Because then that... No, okay, it must not have been Jimmy Jam with the with the Game Boy then. Because, yeah, one of them did. And then he, they kept, like, recording stuff that Prince said. And then... Because that's how Release It starts, too. Right. Because... <laughs> <laughs> he, he uh on his little sampling keyboard he records prince saying release it and then they play it back to him <laughs> yeah uh what but it, one of the greatest scenes in the movie but also just like just more proof that prince has this thing where and it is based on fact because like we talked about last time when he toured with the time the time was in many ways um, you know, some of the musicians in the band were better than the musicians in Prince's band. They had kind of like more immediate songs that like, you know, bangers that people wanted to hear. Uh, they didn't interrupt the show to like talk to God for five minutes. You know, like there was like there were there were reasons why in Purple Rain, the time were more popular than than the kid, you know. Um, but I feel like he had this thing where he he wanted that to be the case narratively, but he couldn't let it be the case in reality so like in both purple rain and graffiti bridge he does these absolutely like amazing fucking performances and then he just like his compromise is that in the universe of the film everybody hates it like you know he <laughs> it's like a performance so good that it, in purple rain's case it literally makes him a star uh but the people at first avenue are like this is boring Go do the bird like it's it's, well, it's hilarious always, well, it, the thing that like there's a parallel with tick tick bang and darling nikki too where it's like a really sexually explicit song where he's like being very sexual on right. stage and then for some reason, everyone is disgusted by it, which is like, that's like the opposite of, of what well, it's like Prince's own idea of himself being translated onto what other people are thinking. Because right. I'm watching the performance of Tick, Tick, Bang, and I'm like, this is amazing. This man, give this man his award. Right. Let him keep the, the, the club like this. Yeah. He, and he, he won. just thinks he won. Right. And then I'm looking around everybody else on their Game Boy. <laughs> yeah. He thinks you're watching. He thinks you're watching it and thinking, God, the kid would have won if he just sang a song about god like yeah <laughs> uh and like a whole song about coming too soon yeah. <laughs> what a genius right <laughs> speaking of pandemonium i i thought it was i did think that morris kind of shed some light on because it's a it's a good album but it is it's it's like a weird grab bag like i was saying because it's like new stuff corporate world stuff stuff from ice cream castle stuff that jam and lewis put together that has barely anything to do with prince you know and and morris confirms that it was recorded in a grab bag way he says uh it was cut helter skelter we recorded in bits and pieces sometimes at paisley sometimes at jam and lewis's flight time studio sometimes in hollywood prince would pop in and out of the studio we never knew when his suggestions were almost always good but his attention was short-lived and before we knew it, he'd flown off to destinations unknown. So that that makes a lot of sense because Pandemonium is it's one of those weird projects where it's like sort of a Prince album, but sort of not. Um, I like that the theme of Pandemonium, like the, the name is Pandemonium, but there's a song about Skillet, right? Yeah. <laughs> a cooking class Skillet. Like there's kind of like a food theme going on too. Yeah. And then the cover, the cover is the time on a Skillet that's on like a, a flaming burner and then there's just like forks and knives and a spoon and then fried chicken and like syrup i think it's such a weird like what is what a strange choice for an album cover the themes <laughs> the themes are are equally uh scattershot in that in that uh album for sure so graffiti bridge is uh is not a hit it is um uh borderline 
career ending for, <laughs> for, for Prince. Um, he has to he has to go cut diamonds and pearls and just like write a bunch of hits just to dig himself out of the hole. Um, <laughs> uh, and it also ends um, the, the time does not um, does not really last either. Um, Prince and Morris drift away. Um, this was interesting. He and his bassist, Richard Freeze Smith, um, put together a girl group called the Daisies, which he admits are formed in the mold of Vanity Six. I, um, I did not do my homework before this, but I just looked up the Daisies, and there is a video on YouTube, um, which I will be linking in the show notes. And, um, they're, yes, in the mold of Vanity Six, but also um, they're all dressed in suits like the time, <laughs> like what? menswear. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> it is kind of awesome. Yeah. Um, and then there's there is also like there, there's other shots of them here, you know, in regular clothes. But but yeah, for the beginning of the of the video, they're all in um, in suits and, and fedoras, which also what didn't I, one of Janet's videos with Jam and Lewis. Um, so he was. He was not only ripping off Vanity Six, but also Janet Jackson, because um, I don't remember which video it was. Kia would know. It might be Pleasure Principle. I'll, I'll have to look it up. But um, but yeah, one of her videos, she's also like in menswear and, and doing the doing the chili sauce slide and, and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway, the J- the Jay-Z's were not uh, Morris's ticket to um, to solo success. Um, it is kind of funny. I don't think we've mentioned this in the last episode. I think I've probably written about it at some point in like Jerry Curl June stuff. But um, I, I love the trajectory of Prince's protégés, like angrily severing ties with Prince. They're like, we're finally free of that little fucking tyrant. And then they they do music that is exactly like Prince's music. Uh, or, you know, to the point where even like Morris is trying to put together a, a girl group side project. Um, it's just it's just funny that they break away and then they they try to follow the same mold. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is kind of like this is Morris's dark hour. Um, the the uh, <laughs> the girl group doesn't kick off. He he puts out a um, he puts out an album called Guaranteed, which is supposed to be uh, sort of New Jack Swing influenced and um, doesn't work. Um, I've actually have you listened to Guaranteed? No, I, I haven't either. I'll I have to check it so. out. Yeah, I have not investigated that particular. I mean, it's 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 hard to feel much um, enthusiasm for it when even Morris Day is like, yeah, that album sucked. <laughs> but yeah. I'm kind of but I'm curious about it. Uh, so I, I, I might... listened to It's About Time, which is the one from 2004 that has like E40 and stuff on it. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, it's actually not bad. It just sounds like the music you would expect to uncle to make in 2004 <laughs> right right i'm sure guaranteed is not good but also as we remember meatloaf said the same thing about uh blind before i stop and that and it's album, my favorite meatloaf fucking album, rules so. so yeah you never know um he also kind of like tries to launch an acting career but that doesn't really happen um he's in a sitcom with tisha campbell called heart and soul um wasn't he, he on an episode of Moesha? He was. I don't. He doesn't me- mention it here, but I remember. I remember it coming on. Uh, I, I remember seeing it. Yeah, basically just playing Morris Day and just kind of like through the nineties. Um, yeah, he's just like depressed for the whole nineties. His marriage starts falling apart. Uh, his his wife wants him to go to <laughs> go to therapy, and which which makes her less sexually attractive to him. <laughs> I know. Just, like I feel like if anyone needs to go to therapy, it's probably Morris Day and right. he's saying how he doesn't <laughs> want to go to therapy. But you know what? I completely like it's the same reason that I stopped going to therapy, but also definitely need to go, which is that I go to therapy and I don't want to fucking talk to them. Right. So it doesn't yeah. help me out. So I'm like, well, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I mean that is like that's the classic uh that's the classic dilemma that you know, you need to talk to somebody but but like you have to do all the work. So yeah, I I get it too. I I think this part is interesting because um maybe it's because of his persona or um it it could just be because you you don't see as many 
black male entertainers talk about depression. Um, but the fact that Morris actually puts a name to it and says, you know, he says like straight up, I was depressed. Um, I thought was interesting. It's, it's just interesting to hear that from Morris day. Yeah. Um, he doesn't want to go to therapy, but he admits that he was depressed. <laughs> so I thought that was, I, I, I thought this was, uh, um, you know, he's pretty, he's pretty transparent. Uh, in, in what, one thing I will say about this book and he's willing to paint himself in kind of a, an unflattering light because his, he's definitely not the good guy in his breakup with, with Judith and, uh, Spoiler alert, he ends up leaving her for a much younger woman. Yeah, who um, he's still and, with. <laughs> who he's still with. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's unapologetic about this, but but he also but but he also admits that it was like really hurtful to his first wife and you know he felt bad about it. And um so yeah, it's it's uh the 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 honesty I think is pretty is pretty refreshing. But I want to talk about Rayvon to the Joy Fantastic, or I'm sorry, Rayvon to the Year 2000, uh, because this is one of the. It's probably my favorite part of the book. Uh, so they spend the whole 90s estranged from each other. Um, then Prince, you know, every couple of years, or he's still the artist. Every, every couple of years, uh, the artist formerly known as Prince wants to do this big commercial revival. And obviously the nineties, he was kind of in the wilderness. He changed his name. Everybody thought he was crazy. He went so, you know, he, he got, uh, his, out of his contract with Warner brothers and, um, went independent, which is like great, but also means that his music is not being promoted as much. And, um, so he tries to make this big splash in 1999, uh, you know, smartly realizing that everybody's going to be playing the song 1999, and he tries to do it with Clive Davis, who had just engineered the big comeback for Santana, Supernatural. Uh, and Rave to the Joy Fantastic is a deeply flawed album that um, that fails at being a Supernatural <laughs> knockoff. He tries to do the whole Supernatural thing. He does a song with Sheryl Crow. He does a song with uh, Eve, um, like a bunch of, you know, people that were like big big news in 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 the 90s uh he 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 covers um, every day is a winding road <laughs> one of the most hilarious uh things prince has ever done but uh it did not it did not go off uh, you know it was nowhere near the success that supernatural was um but he also does this pay-per-view show from paisley park called rave onto the year of 2000 which is uh, highly recommended. Like that <laughs> shit is so good. He's in that like lycra blue jumpsuit that he wore during that period. There's a, there's this whole part. My, my favorite part is <laughs> at the end of the show, he like slides down this little slide, um, <laughs> like a like a like a, an angled part of the stage, like it's a slide on a playground, and the, he like puts it in slow motion because Prince. Uh, loves to do crazy editing in his in his uh, <laughs> any video that he has anything to do with, and and, and there's this and it it do, it like kind of dissolves through all of these other moments from the show as if he's like sitting there thinking about all the cool stuff that he literally just did. <laughs> it's so funny. I My love it so much. My favorite part is the part that Morris mentions. In, yes. In this, that uh, years ago when I watched um, Raven to the Year 2000, I live tweeted it <laughs> as I was watching it, my reaction to it. And um, I think I either made or Kinesa made a, a uh, I think I like requested uh, either Kinesa or somebody else make me a, a GIF <laughs> of Morris Day swing. Might have been Erica too. It do, was somebody, do you still but, have it? Uh, I don't think so. No, unfortunately. <laughs> but I did have a GIF of, of Morris um, swinging onto the stage and falling, um, which is how he <laughs> enters the stage. And uh, in part one, I did ask if he if he talked about this, and he, right. he did. It takes up about two paragraphs. Yeah. And, he explains that it's not actually him swinging; it's a, a stunt double, which I that did not was know. A huge disappointment. Yeah, I, that's one of those things that. Well, that Prince I'm... was also disappointed. Prince <laughs> says, "I was yeah. disappointed. I wanted to see you fly, bro." <laughs> we all did. Uh, yeah, I. I th this kind of it reminds me of. There's a similar thing with this with Prince, the famous ass out pants from the VMAs. Um, 
I spent most of my life just assuming that 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 we all saw Prince's ass. Like <laughs> I, I I thought so. And then I then his costume designer came out and revealed that uh, it was flesh colored fabric pads. <laughs> And I felt like somebody told me Santa Claus wasn't real. Like that was one of the most disappointing things I've ever heard. Um, and this isn't quite on the level of not seeing Prince's ass cheeks, but um, it is up there because, yeah, that was a, a truly I- iconic entrance. <laughs> uh, this is also around the time that Prince starts converting to Jeho- Jehovah's Witness. So my favorite part of this chapter is where the time show up at Paisley Park, uh, Morris and the, the new lineup of the time. And, um, and, and, and Prince like lectures them, like does the preaching thing that he was doing in the late nineties and early two thousands. Uh, I'll just read this, this segment it says during that same weekend, the time played Paisley Park for the rave thing. He had the time meet him in one of his studios. We were hoping we might get to record with him, but no, he wanted to have a talk with us. Before that, I'd never known Prince to have talks. It had always been about rehearsing, playing, and perfecting music. Prior to the talk, we were told that while at Paisley, we couldn't eat any form of meat or drink any kind of booze. Prince's talk was long and boring. He wasn't talking with us. He was talking at us. He was preaching. Essentially, he was telling us to embrace the Jehovah's Witness system of belief. He was using all sorts of arguments. That was the boring part to prove his point. Uh, And he goes on to, you know, so this goes on for a long time. Uh, You know, Morris does not react well to being preached at. And then um, (laughs) uh, so it says the ramp was so long that it came in two parts. Prince gave us a short break. He probably had to use the facilities while he was gone. (laughs) My guitarist, Tori, who knew I had a flask of cognac on me, asked for a taste. Uh, He so he takes a sip and then gives it back to Tori. When Prince when Prince reached the climax of his argument, the cognac flask slipped out of the pocket of Tori's oversized jeans onto the floor. Everyone, including Prince, just stared at it. Without saying a word, Tori picked up the flask and put it back in his pocket while Prince resumed his attempt to convert the time. (laughs) Um, So yeah, Prince tries to make the time convert to Jehovah's Witness, and they don't. And this is, at least according to Morris, uh, he's pretty sure that this is the reason why they didn't do anything for a while again. Uh, So that's pretty wild. Um, And also, you know, totally squares with everything uh, that we've heard about Prince at this time. And don't even need to hear it because he would literally do this on stage. So it is not at all surprising. (laughs) Uh, So then they're, they're away from each other again. Um, I, I I loved this part where, um, where Nellie mentions Morris during a television interview in 2003. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um he says uh i've always liked his his beats but wondering where he's hanging out these days i i it's just it's just funny to me that uh that nelly liked morris day's beats because first also, of all they're, they're not morris day's beats <laughs> i also like that um morris refers to nelly as the hottest rapper out there <laughs> was nelly even the hottest rapper out there at like at the time maybe like maybe literally when hot in here came out like maybe literally right that second rapper right by the same standards that mc hammer was the hottest rapper in 1990 you know right right (laughs) but that's how morris gets his new manager because he's also nelly's manager (laughs) the manager hooks him up with bob cavallo who was prince's manager during purple rain and that's how um What's the album called? You 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 mentioned it. It's about time. Of course, it's, I, I was like, I knew it's a time pun. Uh, it's about time. That's how that came out. Um, and then because of It's About Time, he runs back into Prince on the Musicology Tour. Uh, and then they fall out again. Before they fall out, though, I, I liked this, that um, apparently Prince recommended that... Um, Morris work with Lil John. <laughs> yeah, that was the other thing that I read too. Yeah, that's hilarious. I wish that had happened. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, he's worked with Trinidad James, so like I, honestly, well, yeah. uh, like Lil John, he it could still happen. You know, um, to if anything, a Lil John collab is more likely now than it was in two thousand four because right. Lil John was one of the hottest rappers of of two thousand four. Uh, I, I would say more so than Nelly. So. Um, 
Well, and Little John appeared on the same season of Celebrity Apprentice as Meatloaf and Gary it all, Busey. It all comes full circle. <laughs> Morris Day had a song <laughs> called the Trump Flag Version. So. <laughs> it's all leading into the same thing. Um, I saw, this is when I saw the time. Um, I've only seen them once, but it was on the Musicology Tour. And I do remember it was like super exciting. It was almost so like... Okay, so this is why they fell out, because Prince said, I want you to open for us on the Musicology Tour. And then in a classic Prince move, he was like, just kidding, you're only going to open on some dates, and I'm not going to announce what dates those were. And on the one hand, I can completely sympathize with Morris Day when he's like, that's bullshit. Uh, You told us it was going to be for the whole tour. Like, you're dicking us around, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I get it. But from the perspective of somebody who was at one of the shows or I was at two of the shows in Detroit. Um, The first one, the time did not open the second one, the time did. And when the lights went down before that second show and I heard the clock ticking and I was like, Oh my fucking God, it's the time. Like I, (laughs) it was amazing. It was all, it almost was more exciting than Prince. Like that, that was how cool it was. So I, I, have to admit that Prince had a point that keeping them a surprise was that that was cool. So, but that was their that was their next falling out. Um, <laughs> I thought this was interesting because around he says that right around this time Prince said like before before they dropped off the Musicology tour Prince was like I've been I've been writing some songs um, that I have in mind for you and I would almost bet money that one of those songs is Lolita on 3121. Oh, yeah. Um, I was just recently listening to that, too. Yeah. Uh, Because I think that that's what Prince would do. He would write songs in a time mold. And then, like, if he and Morris were on good terms, he'd get Morris to record it. If they weren't on good terms, he'd go ahead and record it himself. He did the same thing with with Movie Star in the the 80s that came out on Crystal Ball later. So, um, yeah, I am, like, 90% sure that, that Lolita was... If if he if at the time it just uh, converted to, to Jehovah's become Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Lolita might have been a time song. So yeah, that's basically the pattern for the rest of the book. Like they they get back together and then Prince does something to piss Morris Morris off because uh, then uh, Prince plays Minneapolis on uh, July seventh, two thousand seven, um, which my ex wife was at that show. Um, and she she drove out from Kansas City to see that to see that show. And um, this is like probably the most fucked up thing Prince does in the book because he he invites uh, he invites the band um, to open for them, puts them up in a shitty hotel in Chanhassen. Uh, and then they get there and they're like we're not staying out here. The show's in Minneapolis. We're going to stay in a nice hotel in Minneapolis. So um, they do that. And then possibly because of that, possibly because he was offended that they didn't want to use his hotel, possibly also just because he was Prince. Uh, he's like, never mind. You're, you're not, you're not playing for us. You all have to go home. So, um, uh, and then at that same show, he had Wendy from the revolution come out and play. So, um, just a very, just a very strange, uh, episode and it's never really explained. Um, and it's, I feel like this is actually the longest they spend at odds with each other because after this happens, Morris is like, fuck you. I'm never, I'm never doing this again. Um, and they don't see each other for 10 years until like months before Prince dies. I, I took two things away from this one. One, I really wish that I could live my life like Prince and just not, <laughs> I know not be like basically be off the grid like you can't communicate with me. I don't have a phone. You right. Have to talk through someone else. Like I wish, I wish that was my life. Um, but the second one is like in a later chapter, um, Morris keeps talking about it being like pride that kept him from talking with Prince and like sitting down and like, <laughs> talking it through. And I like I get that to a point, but also like Prince harmed him. Right. Right. <laughs> like that was harm in such a way that like it would it would make sense 
for Morrison never speak to him again. Yeah, I, like, I would probably if I got if I flew my whole band all the way out from L.A. and was then stood up <laughs> with no explanation, no apology. Yeah, I would probably. And you had to pay for the travel cost. They they finally got Prince to like pay them for something. Right, like a portion of it, but they still had. Yeah, it's still like financially harmed him and, and 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 yeah prince was in a much better like this was mid comeback like he was flush with cash uh he was fucking giving away cds on the daily mail like yeah it is it's it's a really fucked up thing and i i agree like i i don't see any reason why i i would have if that was me prince would have had to pick up the phone first too because like why the fuck would i even bother right um but then it's also like yeah he literally couldn't contact prince um he he also says that this is why when the time the original lineup of the time gets back together, they hear through Prince's lawyers that they can't call themselves the time and they try to reach out to him and they physically cannot get a hold of him. And so that's why they just said, well, screw it. We'll just be the original seven. Um, and I have heard that album and it's like it's pretty good. It's not you know, it's not amazing, but it's it's better than a, a time album in 2007 would you would expect, I would say. Very uncle, very uncle though. I mean, yeah. that that just goes without saying, I think. <laughs> I mean, Prince Prince was making uncle music for the, you yeah, know, I mean, mo- L- most L- of the Lolita last. Lolita is a fucking uncle. <laughs> right. There is yeah. some song, because I've been like trying, <laughs> trying, trying to like late Latter-day Prince. And there's some stuff I like. I like a lot of 3121. Mm-hmm. But there was just one song, and it wasn't even Lolita. It was something else that I'm like, I'm trying to like this man, <laughs> but it just sounds like a, a, an uncle trying to mack on a young girl, and I don't yeah. want to listen to it. Like this is yeah. just ridiculous. Yeah, I, I like. I'm I, just I, not interested. <laughs> I hear you. I'm. I'm. Um. I. I have to do this professionally because. I would get uh, crucified by the Prince community if I didn't make an effort. Um, And, you know, it's also like, it's also just if I'm writing about all of his stuff, I have to kind of like appreciate all of it. So I have definitely, I've come a long way. And also I'm older. So like when I was in my 20s, Emancipation was just the corniest album I could possibly imagine. (laughs) Uh, Because it's, it's it's a triple album that he made when he got married and, um, and, you know, wanted to have a kid. Uh, so it's like, it is a, it is by definition, a middle-aged album. It's like his, his version of, uh, double fantasy by John Lennon, you know? Uh, but, but for three albums, <laughs> um, but now that I'm, you know, I'm older now than Prince was when he recorded Emancipation and, um, I I am more of an uncle than 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 I was when I first tried to listen to it, and now it doesn't bother me. Now I actually I actually like quite um, a bit. Of I it. a few songs have grown on me. I really like um, my computer. I love yeah. my computer, and I also like what made me gain an appreciation of that was um, that it, that my computer and then Kate Bush has a couple of songs on her album with Prince on it that I really yeah. like. And so like knowing that that was a collaboration that made me start liking Emancipation more. <laughs> not, not the whole album, but my computer specifically. And then there are other songs that I've listened to since then that have grown on me. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good album. There's just so much of it, you know, and, 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 and so and much of it, of it is, is corny. <laughs> is corny. Yeah. <laughs> I will never, I don't think I will ever get to the point that I like court in time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I in some way, uh, you don't want to get to that point. <laughs> but um, yeah, the the song on um, what what is it? I, why why should I love you? Is yeah, um, I love that song. So good. Yeah, it's an amazing song. That whole um, that whole. I know we're not talking about Kate Bush, but that whole Kate Bush album is really good. Yeah, we would be much more on trend if we were talking about Kate Bush. But yeah, <laughs> maybe the next season of Stranger Things will use Oak Tree and and we'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> or Fishnet or, or Fishnet. Exactly. I think they are in in 1986 uh, currently. So next yeah. ne- next season 87. Uh, you heard it here first. They got to use fishnet. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Oh, so yeah, the, the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. The whole thing about Prince being inaccessible. Um, I thought that that was, I, I always assumed that they did contact him and he was like, no. Um, but the fact that they literally like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who are pretty powerful in the music industry, they could not get a hold of Prince. And yes, that's shitty, but I also have to respect it. Like that, that is, uh, yeah, I wish no one could get a hold of me. That sounds like a 
That sounds like what heaven feels like. <laughs> I know. The, the luxury of, uh, of just like not having to be like, if, if I didn't feel like I had to, to promote my writing, I would, um, I would be off social media in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah, they don't see each other for 10 years. Meanwhile, this is when Morris, um, leaves his, uh, his, his old, old shrew of a wife making him <laughs> go to therapy, uh, for a, for a younger, <laughs> a younger woman. I uh, love this part because <laughs> he breaks up with his wife and then he goes to his home in LA and just blasts, uh, <laughs> Jiggles get lonely too. <laughs> yeah. This was a great part, uh, because it's also like, uh, all right. So first of all, I want to back up for just a second because, um, Something I did not know was that Morris Day briefly had a role as a co-host on the Michael Basden show, oh, yeah. which is maybe the most uncle fact I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk uncle, uh, co-host on the Michael Basden show. Um, so, but then later that same page, yeah, he he's like torn between these two women. So he starts blasting gigolos get lonely too, to the point that his name, his his neighbors are calling to complain. <laughs> I just want to imagine, like, imagine you live in the same uh, building as Morris Day, and then you hear him loudly playing his own music in a fit of depression. <laughs> um, I also thought this was funny because he says uh, this is where he's listening to the he he. he put on his old records and cranked up the volume. I heard myself singing gigolos get lonely too. I was sure as hell lonely, but was I a gigolo? What is a gigolo? <laughs> I looked up the meaning in Webster's. It said something about being a promiscuous lover. I didn't see myself as promiscuous, but I sure did sing that song like I was. So did Morris Day not know what a gigolo was until <laughs> 2007? <laughs> I also love that he has, like, did he look it up online or did he take a, a dictionary off of his bookshelf and look up Jiggle? <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely one of the one of the funniest moments of the book. And then that is pretty much, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, most, most of the whole thing about his second wife, it's like, I get it, you know, like, marriages end, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I'm moving into my second marriage, um, my my second wife is going to be actually older than me, but um, but and also not twenty years older than me. Uh, but you know, it's like it's it's whatever. I I get it that you know, marriages don't work out, and sometimes, especially in the entertainment industry, older men marry marry younger women. But the one part that that definitely my eyebrow went up was when he says Lorena, his second wife, was seven when she saw Purple Rain, and right there and then decided that Morris was going to be her boyfriend. That is weird. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's really weird. <laughs> Especially since it, his first wife, like, one of the things he liked about her was that she didn't really know who he was. I have right. more respect for that <laughs> right. than, than moving on to some younger woman who had a crush on Like, that's weird. And, like, a lot of rock stars in these books have done that. It's right. It's like, it's icky. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, I, and I feel like it's similar where a lot of the time the first wife is like, oh, she she loves me for more than just the fame. And then the second wife, because it's like their midlife crisis wife, is, is like, um, oh, she's always been a fan, you know? Like, yeah, because wasn't Sebastian Bach's second wife I think it, I think wife it was, was like that too. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, she, she had a uh, um, poster of him. Right. She was a teenager or whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tale as old as time. Uh, so I really the last major beat here is that they, Prince and Morris, reconnect. Yeah, this um, book really wraps up quickly. It I know does. we talked about that, but I wasn't even prepared. Like, it really wraps yeah, up. Yeah, it just, like, ends. Yeah, it, it, he just, like, sails through it. Um, it's less than 200 pages long, and that's with a bunch of photos at the end. So, uh... Prince sees the time play the Grammys with Rihanna um, and he invites them to play at Paisley. And I, I thought this was funny. More is accepted on the one condition that they were paid in advance with a cashier's check. Um, so that happened. And I think he talks about this in um, Tales from the Tour Bus, too. Um, and it's, you know, it's a touching it's a touching ending. I think I, I'm not going to I'm I'm, I'm going to deliberately not um, get all emotional, but something that has struck me as someone who, who's just reads a lot about 
about Prince and, you know, um, tries to like keep up with all the stories out there uh, is that in the toward the end of his life, he was really reaching out to people. I think I, I've heard this a lot that um, I, I heard that he reconnected with a bunch of people after Vanity died, like the other members of Vanity Six. He hadn't seen them for years and Apollonia and Jill Jones. Uh, basically all of his old girlfriends, like he got, he kind of got them all together for the first time. Um, Morris Day, obviously he talks about that here. Um, I think him and Andre kind of buried, Andre Simone kind of buried the hatchet toward the end. Um, Like really almost, almost everybody. And I mean, I know that some of this is because he died and now the NDAs are expired and we can all come out of the woodwork and like pretend that, that Prince and us, you know, Prince and, and, and I were cool um, right at the end. But I I think there's some truth to it, too, because it seemed like he was in a more introspective mood. He was writing his memoir, which, um, you know, was obviously never finished, but they they put it out the the unfinished, um, you know, what he'd done of the draft. They put that out a couple years ago. Um, and it just, and you know, everything I've seen from the piano and the microphone tour, he was like telling stories and, and looking back and, um, it's, it's bittersweet because it's like, I like to know that that happened and that, um, he was doing right by some of these people that he had wronged, <laughs> like very objectively wronged, uh, you know, earlier in his career and was kind of um, making amends for that and, and and ending things on a good note. But it also, it kind of makes his death so much sadder because he, he really, it felt like he was kind of a new prince. You know, I, I think his music was going in really interesting directions. He seemed to be a lot more sort of emotionally open and available in his personal life. Um, it, it just makes me wonder, like, you know, what would have happened if he hadn't overdosed i think we could have seen some really amazing stuff from him i mean that the biography could have been amazing um yeah it's just um it's just such a shame um but you know the other side of that is it's prince so he was very mercurial and he could have just he, he could have burned all those bridges again and decided to stop writing the book and put it on the shelf. And, you know, like, like anything could have happened. So uh, I, I try not to get too hung up on like, you know, being sad about Prince, but, but I do think um, Morris does a good job of kind of talking about uh, that whole situation and how he felt. And, and he ends the book, you know, saying that like, if there's anything that you can learn from this, it's to reach out to your friends and, and don't let uh, uh, petty or or in some cases, very, very valid grievances yeah. <laughs> against them, uh, you know, screwing with your with your career. Uh, don't let that hold hold you back from having a friendship. So I don't know. I, I thought it I, I, I thought it ended too soon, but I thought it ended on like a, a really nice and kind of moving note. And um it was a good book. I feel like Morris did kind of let us see the the man behind the mask, which is surprising. Um, it's because even honestly, even in interviews, he's not really that forthcoming and he's always kind of in character as Morris Day. So I, I do think that this was like a surprisingly intimate book. Um, and I personally, you know, I'm not one of those people that's like Prince wouldn't have wanted this because Prince didn't want a lot of shit like Prince. Prince didn't want you to swear in front of him, you know, <laughs> like, like there's a part of me that's kind of like, fuck off Prince. Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like I, I get it that people are protective of his legacy and um, in my own work about Prince, I, I try not to um, be like egregiously disrespectful. Um, I still don't think he would have liked my work <laughs> about him, but uh, you know, I, I try to do right by him uh, to some degree. Um, I personally think that this, that it, if, if, if Prince is up there in heaven or wherever, um, you know, <laughs> whatever is after this, the afterworld, uh, and he and he somehow got a copy of Morris's book, I I don't think that he would have been upset by it because I think it was very clearly done with a lot of with a lot of love and um, you know I think it was it was something that that Morris clearly kind of had to do for closure to this, the, you know, this relationship that really defined his whole life. You know, they'd known each other since they were kids and, uh, and it was the impetus for his whole, his whole career. Um, you know, I, I feel like this is a kind of a story that he had to tell. Um, 
yeah, he, I'm sure he made a, probably a bigger paycheck from it than he's made in a while. But I, I do think that it was heartfelt and, and real. And I, I don't think Prince feel, would have had a problem with it. It doesn't feel overly exploitative either because like who the fuck is going to buy and read this except for people like us? Right. <laughs> Right. And it's not and like print other Prince fans. Like, yeah. You know, and and the stuff that fans. he says about Prince, it's not tell all, you know, like this, the stuff that he says is like, who didn't know that Prince was kind of a dick? Like, you know, like that's not it, it's it's it shouldn't be spoiling anybody's uh, impressions of Prince. It's not like he's revealing air, you know, dirty laundry. He's he's saying the things that we already knew about Prince was that he would get jealous and kind of pull the rug out from under you uh, if he felt threatened, you know? And right. that's like, I mean, we were all there when the time broke up. We know. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I, I, I thought it was a good book. It's pro- Again, it's probably arguably a little bit too good for us. Uh, maybe we should have read White Slave by... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> by Big Chick instead. <laughs> but there's always that in the future. Now, I think we decided what our next book is going to be. So let's uh, go ahead and announce that. There were a few contenders. We had been thinking about Steven Tyler's book, but I think um, the short version is we don't know where Callie's copy of it is anymore. Yeah, it, think, may, it may have been in the car that was We stolen. think it might have been in the car. I think that uh, the thieves specifically staked out the car and and stole the book. I think it was all a cover to steal your copy of Does the Noise in My Head Bother You by Steven Tyler. Uh, but that's an uh, as yet unproven theory. Um, so we don't have, so it's like now we have no reason to read that. That was like, that was like Sebastian Bach. It was always on our back list. And then we were also thinking about reading Rod Stewart's autobiography because we were originally planning on seeing Rod Stewart uh, next month. But now um, Kelly does not have transportation to drive to to Maryland and is also, uh, you know, very understandably feeling gun shy about going to a concert after (laughs) I got COVID from a concert. So, you know, we'll probably still read it at some point because I I love to make uh, Rod Stewart jokes, but um, it's no longer as pressing a concern. So ultimately what we landed on was we have never read a book by or about a woman (laughs) and that feels like uh when half of the podcast is a a woman or at least not a man and both of us are feminists and want to kind of make rock music not just a big sausage party so um i felt like that was an oversight so we're gonna read um pamela debar's i'm with the band which is kind of like a classic uh very trashy it'll Um, probably also be a sausage party though (laughs) It's also a sausage, like quite literally a sausage party. <laughs> it's um, I am I'm aware of the double standard that uh, you know, we we read all of the men we've we've read about have been musicians. Pamela DeBar was um, you know, best known as a groupie, but I think she's also like a, a, a raconteur and um and just like a a fly on the wall for for so much um of rock and roll and like the rock and roll that that we really especially are into that I think it's going to be a fun read. And also there's nothing wrong with being a groupie. So, you know, if you're interested in reading along with us, um, I will put a link up uh, for our bookshop store and send us your comments. Like always, we're on Twitter, Headbangers BC, Dystopian Tweets. We're on Instagram, Headbangers BC and Dystopian Graham. And you can even email us at headbangers at dystopiandanceparty.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your patience uh, as we recovered from our from our traumas um, uh, this this month. And hopefully, hopefully there won't be more. Um, I know that I feel like I'm at least not going to get covid for for at least a a couple more uh, months. I've got my immunity. So um, so that like, let's hope that nothing else happens, that that's. That's what I'm, I'm going to put out there for this episode. Uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. 